Good morning. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this uh, Digital Solutions to Natural Challenges uh, webinar. We are waiting a bit, a couple of minutes maybe, to allow people um, to join in. Right now, we have a bit more than 80, close to 90 participants already. So we are expecting a bit more than that. But yeah, let's wait a, a minute or two, and then we can uh, get going. As you will see, well, everybody but the speakers is um, muted for the moment, so we can keep a, a nice and tidy uh, room. So you can use the chat at any moment just to send greetings. Maybe you can say, uh, where are you from? Uh, say hi, uh, especially if you have uh, no one person seen the, in the audience that you can see through the participants. Also important, if you can please, in the participants list, uh, rename yourself uh, with your uh, full name so we know who we have in the audience today. It's always uh, nice to address people or see who is uh, joining the webinar with us, okay? So my name is Fernando Pinillos. Welcome again. I work for Europar Federation Communications Department and I will be the facilitator of this webinar. Today, I have my colleague Simone um, supporting us in the chat and she will be uh, pretty much dynamizing a bit the chat, uh, asking any general question that you may have and also uh, going over the questions at the end of the webinar, okay? So a bit of the webinar rules. Um, the webinar is being recorded. The session will be public. So you can use uh, start or stop your video camera at your convenience, okay? Um, it's important to note that you can write all the questions that you want in the chat, especially during the presentations, addressing the speaker you would like to ask the question. This is because for the moment, we are not opening the, the microphones to ask like a live question. So you should address them in the chat and then Simone, at the end of the webinar, we'll go over the questions, we'll gather them all, and she will. Um, we will try to reply them together with the speakers to, to answer them um, as many as we can, okay? So if we have time um, at the end of the webinar, normally webinars are one hour 15, one hour and a half when we extend it, we can allow uh, live interventions. And for that, we will ask you to raise your digital hand that you can find in the um, reactions uh, menu in, in your Zoom window, okay? For the rest of the time, as I mentioned, you, uh, you cannot open your microphone. So uh, yeah, we, we will keep it like this. Again, all the presentations and recordings, they, they, they will uh, be public later on. We publish them in, in uh, our website, Europark website, and uh, they will be distributed by email to the participants that have registered to the webinar, okay? So what, for those of you that do not uh, know Europark, uh, uh, a bit of context of who we are. Um, Europark has been active for 50 years. Last year, we celebrated the, the half century uh, anniversary. So we are a membership association. Uh, we are conformed by a network of more than 400 members that are distributed in 40 countries around Europe and the UK, okay? So our family, let's call it like that, is distributed uh, in sections. We have eight sections that uh, they have a specific, a specific function of uh, coordinating the work or uh, representing the federation at uh, national level or regional level. So some sections, for example, Spain has a, a section on its own. Um, the Central Eastern Europe section includes several countries, so it's... Yeah, this is the way that we articulate our uh, network, okay? A bit of our objectives and work. So the main objective of Europark is to represent the interest of protected areas in uh, Europe. And we are specialized in facilitate, uh, facilitating the networking, the exchange of experience, and increasingly more uh, in capacity building and training uh, our uh, the members of our network. So for this purpose, we organize uh, different conferences, like the one that we are going to host this year online. We 
have it. Um, we have an annual conference that uh, uh, is uh, normally face to face, but this year we are hosting it online in November. So there is more inf information in our website. We host uh, seminars and workshops for our members. We also run different commissions and task forces, which are groups of experts from our network that are working together uh, for the same purpose. For example, we have a commission on peri-urban parks, a commission on health and well-being in protected areas, sustainable agriculture, management effectiveness, and so on. So you can have also a look in our website on, on the different commissions. We are increasingly more and more specialized or becoming more uh, proficient in capacity building, especially online or blended uh, together with face-to-face -face events for our members. So in this regard, we have a specific and separated platform from our website, which is called the European Nature Academy, which is being developed um, yeah, under the Life Enable project, which is a project that is, uh, well, this webinar is being organized together with the Life Enable, Enable project, okay, just uh, for information. So Simone is going to share in the chat the, the link to the European Nature Academy for if you want to have a look to it. For the moment, it's in a development sta state or phase, so we don't have many open courses for um, uh, open to the public, so they are normally under registration, and uh, they are included in specific uh, actions of projects, but it will evolve in the future, okay? Okay. Another interesting resource that you uh, you may want to check is uh, the case studies and toolkits. So we uh, regularly collect uh, case studies from our network. What is this? Is case studies are either solutions or uh, ways or actions that uh, our members have found to tackle different challenges or obstacles or problems in the in regards to protected area management. So they are always inspiring to see how people have done different things or found different solutions to normally common problems that protected area uh, managers have. We also have um, uh, well uh, a good representation at policy level. We issue, uh, we produce policy papers and recommendations and we are regularly in uh, dialogue, in constant dialogue with the European Commission. And we host webinars like this one like the one that we are organizing today. So if you want more information, either our website or our social media channels will give you all the information that you may need. So for today's, for today's webinars, um, well, digital solutions to natural challenges, how new technology is changing the rules. It has been changing it for many years indeed because technologies existed, especially have been implemented in protected areas for, for a long time, but they are increasingly evolving and um, there is always a lot of information that we need to catch up on in this regard, okay? So... Again, the webinar is being organized in the framework of Life Enable Project, a capacity building initiative for protected area and Natura 2000 managers. Okay. And yeah, about technology. So, since they have become a fundamental component of nature conservation, um, the big array of technologies can be a bit uh, daunting, a bit overwhelming. Okay. The different scenarios and purposes in which they can be applied. It often makes it really difficult to find the solutions or to find the resources that we specifically need, okay? So through this webinar, we are going to try to shed some light into this subject. And we have two speakers. On one hand, Vanessa Berger, who is a senior researcher and project manager at the UNESCO Chair for the Sustainable Management of Conservation Areas at Carinthia University in Austria, will speak about the Biomonitech project, which offers a collection of interactive tools and applications that can help conservationists to identify appropriate tools for biodiversity monitoring. And on the other hand, we have Larissa Posch, who is project manager at ECO, the Institute of uh, Ecology in Austria. And Larissa will show us how we can carry out inventories of trees using terrestrial laser scanners and drones, okay? She will present the work they are doing in the RORAC uh, Natural Forest Reserve in Austria to calculate the carbon storage capacity of a forest for different purposes, such as uh, calculating carbon, carbon credits or to implement uh, climate change adaptation strategies. And as I said before, at the end of the webinar, we will have uh, a round of questions and answers. We will try to answer all the questions uh, at the end of both presentations. So we don't, we won't stop in between presentations. 
So please uh, remember to write in the chat all the questions that you may have and also to address the, uh, every question to a specific speaker or leave it in general. So if you don't mention any specific speaker, we will consider it's a general question, okay? So from my side, I think it's everything. I just would like to check if Vanessa is ready. Thank you very much for the introduction. I will try to share my presentation and then I'm ready. Thanks, Vanessa. So also a warm welcome from my side. It's really nice that I can present uh, some results of our project Biomonitech. We are working um, on this project for now since uh, 2021. So it's a quite huge project with 1. million euro funding from the Austrian uh, Federal Ministry. And uh, we are situated at the Korean University of Applied Science in Austria, you already know. And this is a picture of uh, artificial intelligence to show how much technology is out, out there and how many um, species landscapes also uh, we want to monitor. In the project, we were focusing on developing uh, different monitoring schemes or workflows to look at what technology is out there, what can we use, and is it already ready to use it in a park? Because uh, we do not want to, to uh, take a technology which is not ready for monitoring, because monitoring means we want to know this for several times and not just for one timestamp. Um, everything we found out, we tried to put into this polyglot, uh, which is a global guideline on monitoring. And we also developed a configurator on monitoring to help a little bit to transfer the knowledge, what did we learn, and also to help decide what tool could be fit to your park or conservation area in general. Here is a small overview on uh, the technology we were focusing on. So we focused on remote sensing, advanced genetic methods, uh, automated recording units, apps, platforms, and also applied data science, because not just gathering data is everything, we also need to analyze the results. Here is an example of a digital twin of ecosystems, so one uh, tool, the remote sensing in close range and also from aerial, I think you know already, or satellite. I think Larissa will tell us a lot more about such digital twins, but all in all, a digital twin is just uh, some data who, which describes habitats uh, we have in our parks, just that you have an, an idea what I'm talking about. And we were focusing a lot of image recognition. So I think all of you know already camera traps to see what are the animals doing out there and whom they meet maybe. But um, we get a lot of data. And we thought about, um, let's do another approach. Let's have a look on what can we do with insects. So we started to uh, have time-lapse photography of insect images. So you see um, on the left side a bee. And because we get from one camera per day 1,000 images, it was really not uh, easy to, to analyze anything. So we tried to, or we did it. So we, we trained an algorithm. So with a lot of labeling, then see what's going on. Does our algorithm really is able to, to see what taxa we have out there? Um, but at the end, if you have a good labeling, then you really get nice results. But always have in mind garbage in, garbage out. So it's really a lot of work to training the algorithms. Uh, also for the image recognition, we had another approach where we not um, just take pictures of camera traps, we also took pictures from a drone. So we were flying with the drone and then we analyze or count the birds um, on the pictures of the drone imagery. And as you can see here, we not were able to count every 
but at the end we know the error. So this is the good thing about um, AI or all those algorithms, machine learning and so on, that you know the error because this is not so easy if you have several um, guys out there to know the error of everyone that human also makes mistakes, not only our artificial intelligence. Um, another uh, thing we working quite regularly on is just taking the picture. So really document our habitat in high resolution, as you can see here. And another advantage of using uh, drones or also satellite imagery. So in this case is the NDVI. So we get an idea of the health of the, the plants in here. And as you can see here, quite greenish. So here we could see a difference, but it's not that easy if we only look at an RGB image. And to really get also an idea of a low cost uh, monitoring, um, we try to use really simple devices like a camera to also make 3D point clouds of a forest. So here you can see this data set we gathered with the GoPro, so quite cheap. You have to make a lot of photos and also it takes some time if, until it's ready. But at the end, uh, we also get here a really nice documentation of the forest. Um, another technology group we were focusing on is the acoustic monitoring. So in here we have several different devices you could take. So there is the song meter, the audio muscle, some which are quite cheap. Uh, then you, we also have one station. So this is a station from National Park Dona Awan, but uh, which can send the data live. You always have to think if you really need every time the data live or if it's okay to get an overview of the data once a month. But this means the sensor could be out there for a longer period and also can hear things we were not able to hear, like uh, it is for the for the bats in the ultrasonic frequency. And I brought today one of our example. And this is um, a ptarmigan, rock ptarmigan monitoring in the national park of uh, Hoa And here, I think you now should hear the, the voice. If not, it, it doesn't matter. So this is the rock ptarmigan. So it means it's a bird in the Alpine region. So if you want to know more about this bird, you have to go uh, up very early, so four in the morning, you should be there for monitoring. And we, at the moment, there are questions like, are we too late if we're up there? Because there's climate change. Then also the day and night activity is somehow um, shifting sometimes. And so a sensor is really nice because we had uh, nine sensors out there for a month. So you get data every day over the time period of a month and you can have a, a much better feeling if, if the existing monitoring schemes we have are really sufficient. So it's not only to always take new data sets, it's also about um, to prove if what we are doing at the moment, if it's fine or if we have to rearrange our protocols. And what we learn in all, all uh, those technological stuff is we get a lot of data. So with those five audio models, we got 10,770 data sets. So it's always good if you uh, also like to use some, some computer statistics and so on, because you will have a lot of data sets. But at the end, data sets are comparable to each other. So you really prove the existence um, of the animals out there. Uh, another um, technology I'm focusing mainly on is this real, near real time digital data assessment. So we used a Q field for this because it's not so easy to, to collect data in the field. Also, if you're not using technology, you, you will get a lot of data, meter data, then the parameters you need to assess, then normally you have some spatial data. This is an example uh, of a forest monitoring. So you will have a lot of input data. So we try to really get the data um, 
within the field into a database. And this means you can also make a first quality check. So if the naming is fine, if the GPS is there, if you made a picture. So this makes life much easier out there and the quality is improved. And if you do not have uh, online access, you can upload it later on. Another example is uh, from an old ECO project of mine I'm working on. Uh, the smart uh, so spatial monitoring and reporting tool. So this is an example of a uh, national park Nechisar from Ethiopia. So using digital data assessment does not only mean you get data, it also means that you get a lot of additional meter data. So this is an example that you not only collect on a petrol that there was an incident, you can also prove what is the distance you checked if there is an in incident. So you know also where do we do not have a problem. So this is really a major uh, advantage, not only always using what happened it's also good to know what where do we have really a nice environment without any problems in management there are also other applications like the earth ranger which are really nice um then a colleague of mine was focusing on eDNA. So this is uh, environmental DNA. So you take a sample out of the environment like water or soil, or you can also filter air. And then you have a look what DNA is in there uh, and get an overview on what was out there. So how many species and so you get a really good uh, overview of the environment. So this is an example of our outdoor field lab. And with the genetic methods, you're able to check if there are, uh, so what is the individual out there? How many different species do we have? Or just the number of species, because this is also a number of biodiversity to know how many families do you have out there. And also in here, it's the same for remote sensing, for acoustics, you need the database reference data in the background. So this is a major challenge at the moment to really share nice data to everyone so that we not everyone has to learn everything from the scratch. Um, and all those things we gathered, um, we tried to bring uh, into our monitoring global guideline. So if you think it's uh, nice to write such a thing, then I will let you know, you have to talk to really a lot of people to call it global. So in our case, we have in 204 people involved in discussing if everything is fine, if they think that this is a good idea, um, but we, really try to get the knowledge together. So what do we need for monitoring to have this conceptual thing? What do you need to think about before you start something? Because just using technology start now because it's so nice and losing the old data is really no solution. So, so how to integrate them? So there are a lot of different questions which we try to solve in this guideline. And we also developed a workshop design. So this is an example uh, where I was in Tanzania to have a look on, on how could we implement technology there. And so for the conceptual phase, we think for before you start, you always have to think, why do you want to monitor? When do you want to monitor? What do you want? Who is involved? Where is the monitoring take place? And one of the most important things, do you have enough resources for it? And also for long-term, so not that you just start it once and then you will never get data again to compare if something went good or, or not. And to try to share this knowledge we gained, we build up uh, our so-called monitoring configurator. So um, this is that we try to bring everything in, into a system and in a platform. And there is this uh, configurator, which is the same like the, uh, the workshop design. So this is uh, our so decision support system, which leads you through all the questions to think about carefully. Oh, do I have really thought about the when and the where before I start? And there is also a keyword based search 
to really uh, try that you just can put in a keyword and find a lot of a long list of tools. And also the thematic search uh, is planned to, to help you to think about uh, what's going, what do I need? So starting with the study object, do I, I am interested in vegetation or in birds or in bats? Uh, after that, you need to know, okay, what do I want to have? Is it an inventory? Is, uh, do I want to approve some management decisions? So to really help you uh, think through those questions and then we, at the end up, we come up with a list of tools which could fit to what you want to do. So uh, if you want to have an aerial observation of vegetation, you will find a drone uh, with laser scan, uh, multi uh, spectral camera and so on. And we try to everything which we learn during monitoring. So also the fails. So not only the, the oh, everything is nice <laughs> information. So to really also write what is the best practice example and what um, are the constraints and requirements and so that not every one of us should um, or will make the same problem so that we can learn from each other. Uh, at the moment we are quite ready with the development but um, the tricky thing in here is to really bring in a lot of data and uh, it's we can hopefully publish it soon and then it would be very helpful if everyone could uh, contribute a little bit or just check so that we really can learn from each other and transfer the knowledge and also maybe the data, so the reference data. So this is really important uh, when you're talking about digitalization in protected areas that not everyone has to begin uh, from, the, from the scratch. So thank you very much for uh, your time. And uh, if you have some questions, let's stay in contact and I would hand back to Fernando. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Really interesting. Well, I think this really illustrates uh, what I was mentioning before, the overwhelming amount of technological solutions that are present uh, out there and the difficulty that some conservationists or protected area managers may have when trying to choose or identify, especially without a previous knowledge, what would be uh, the most uh, suitable um, device, approach, process, or technology uh, to be implemented in a protected area for a specific purpose. So I think it's really, it's really important the work that you are doing, both through the guidance that you mentioned and uh, the configurator, uh, especially with, I'm really interested in the configurator part. And I would like to ask you, is it possible to, to get a, a URL? I don't know if you share the, the, the URL address to access the configurator. Is it public already and it can be, it can be used? Yeah, there, there are some parts uh, public already, but it's really in a demonstrator. Um, mm. state, but but this uh, the, the the conceptual thing I can share already. Yes. Okay, perfect. Because I think people just like a quick um, um, check that I did on the chat. I think somebody was asking as well to 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 if the, if this is available because it's really valuable. Okay, and really interesting again. Like well, specific mentions that you did to some uh, technologies, acoustic monitoring. Uh, technologies for habitat description, time-lapse photography of insects. I found that really uh, yeah, interesting. And also the eDNA, which I think is a rapidly uh, evolving technology. And from previous uh, readings and background uh, work that I did is um, really changing the, the, the rules of the game. It's really a big step, a massive leap uh, forward in uh, in conservation, which is uh, something also to keep an eye on, and the uh, electronic DNA. Again, many technologies, many many uses. If you have questions on any specific, uh, uh, well, any specific technology or on the overall uh, um, perspective of, um, that Vanessa just presented, please write them in the chat, and we will discuss them at the end of the of the um, webinar. Okay. So for our second speaker, Larissa, are you ready for your presentation? Yes, I will try to share if yep, you're ready. Please. Yes, we are. <laughs> so I hope you can see it. Um, give it a second because we don't see it yet. 
Okay. Now? Nope. He's coming. We see your Windows screen. Um, now it should work. Yes, 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 yes. Now we are. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. OK. I have to hide this. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so thank you. And hello and welcome to my presentation. Um, once again, my name is Larissa Bosch, and I'm working for the company ECO. And um, before I start with my presentation, for those who um, don't know us, ECO is a research and consulting company in the field of nature conservation based in Klagenfurt, Austria. And we work on national and international projects in forest ecology, nature conservation, um, um, monitoring, habitat mapping, restoration, remote sensing, and these projects. And in my presentation, I would like to show you the advantages of laser scanning technologies um, for recording forest structure parameters and based on a past project, uh, which is called Digital Inventory and Development Analysis for the Natural Forest Reserve Rorach. And um, Vanessa was also part of the project, so maybe she will jump in later in the discussion, um, especially if we talk about the field recording. Um, now, to the project, um, it was a repetition of the forest structure analysis from 1996, done by Graper et al. And, um, but in the past study from 1996, only a classic field sample inventory was carried out and in our repetition, we tested um, three different technologies and compared them with each other. So um, at first we did uh, inventory sampling in the field. Um, and then a second, we um, did an elevation with terrestrial laser scanning. And the third, we made an evaluation from drone-based laser scanning. Before I start to explain the three methods, um, I would like to explain um, what is the purpose um, of a forest structure analysis. Um, a forest structure analysis includes the collection of data on various aspects of the forest, forest such as tree species, age classes, tree height, um, the diameter of tree height, and it offers several benefits. Um, based on the information obtained from the structure analysis, um, responsible planning of timber, harvesting, and sustainable forest management is possible. Um, also, um, an assessment of conservation of biodiversity is possible, and it helps um, monitoring changes in the forest, um, which may be related to climate change. Um, of the, on, also the biomass of a forest can be determined on basis of a forest structure analysis. And um, I want to explain also why is this an important information. Um, forests play a major role, role in climate change. They are gigantic carbon storages and their biomass can be used to calculate the carbon storage capacity. And this helps in deciding when and whether a tree should be felled and leads to sustainable timber management. And um, forest biomass is also linked to various ecosystem services. So um, now back to our project. Um, the study area was the Nature Reserve Rorach, um, which is located in Vorarlberg. This is in Western Austria. And um, since 1992, it has been a nature forest reserve, um, which means um, since there are no forest reuse is permitted. Uh, and the forest consists mainly of beech and spruce for beech forests. Um, this map shows again the boundaries of the nature forest reserve, Barach. And as I already mentioned, um, we have compared three methods. And in this project, and all um, these methods had a different sample size. For the classic inventory sampling, a grid of 100 by 100 meters were laid over the area, and each and on each intersection point, a sample uh, for the classic forest inventory was taken. So in the end, we received 44 test areas for this method. 
Um, for the TLS um, data, uh, for the terrestrial basis scan data, we only received 18 test areas because um, of the difficult and steep ter terrain, we couldn't visit um, every test area with the scanner. And um, for the drone-based laser scanning, um, th this could be carried out for the entire area. Then I will start with the classic inventory sampling. As I already mentioned, we had 44 test areas. And starting from the sampling center, all trees within a 10 meter radius were recorded, but only trees with a diameter at tree height uh, of more than 10 centimeters were recorded. Uh, we recorded the tree position, um, the tree species, the vitality of the if the tree was dead or alive, the diameter at tree height, and normally also the height would be recorded, but um, we later derived it from the terrestrial laser scan data. The volume calculation for the classic inventory sampling was based on the formula from the scene. The volume is estimated by using the height and the diameter at tree height and um, forest to farm numbers, which are depending on the tree species. But this method only elevates the forest to relevant transparent and not the total biomass of the trees. Um, the volume calculation for the lying dead wood was carried out using the line intersect module. For this, um, two transect lines with a length of 20 meters, um, which uh, intersect at the sampling centers were defined, and uh, the transects are aligned in the fall line, and they were um, orthogonal to each other. And um, those pieces of that work that intersect the transect lines are counted as sample elements, and those who didn't intersect were not counted. Um, they're not counted, you can see in gray, and the others in color here. Um, the next method I want to um, present is the terrestrial laser scanning. As I already mentioned, we took 18 plots with a Regen scanner. We took 10 to 20 scan positions and all trees within a 30 meter, meter radius of the sample centers would be recorded. Um, the Roman, Romanian company ST Forest Designs helped us um, to analyze um, the terrestrial laser scan data and with the help of their automatic analysis, the height and the diameter at freeze height of each scan tree could be estimated. And um, the volume of each individual tree um, was determined by fitting cylinders into the tree point cloud. And in contrast to the volume calculation that I explained above, by the other method, um, all changes in the diameter of the trunk are taken into account by this method. Um, one result we obtained from the terrestrial uh, laser scan data is the drone height model and the single tree positions. <laughs> you can see here the yellow dots, these are the single trees. And another product also called point density maps, and we got them at ground level and above ground level. And at ground level, you can see the stem positions and dead wood, and above ground um, level, you have a well look on the grounds. Then the third method was the drone based laser scanning, um, which we did for the entire area, and um, the area survey was carried out by the company Alto Drones. Here you can see the flight path and um, the point density of the flight and the average point density was over 4,200 points per square meter. And this is really a lot. Um, one product uh, we got from the UOV data was the true autophoto. It's a rectified and true to scale image without object tilting. Then here we also got a canopy height model for the entire area and um, point density maps at ground level and above ground level. Um, then our project partners from the University of Vienna carried out the lying deadwood analysis based on the drone based laser scanning. For the detection of the lying deadwood, a knowledge based um, knowledge based decision tree was used. Um, there are geometric and radiometric properties of the laser points were taken into account, and a voxel based approach 
was uh, used to estimate the volume. Um, but this method also has its limitations, especially in areas where stem swelling over stems or um, in areas of missing laser points um, because of shading. Here is a comparison of uh, manual digitalization and the automatic classification uh, of the lying deadwood. And you can see there are still a lot of artifacts, um, um, stone outlines or whatever. Um, before I come to the comparison of the results of the three methods, I want to talk briefly about the calculation of carbon storage based on the biomass. Um, the trunk volume is the starting point from which um, the volume of the other three parts, such as roots, branches, and leaves, can be determined. I will show this on the next slide in detail. And um, the average density of the wood can be used to determine the dry biomass of the individual parts, um, which uh, is the basis for quantifying the bar carbon. And many of the parameters required um, for this differ depending on the tree species, and this must be taken into account for the calculation. Um, here again in detail, based on the trunk volume and taking into account the tree species, the volume of the individual parts of the tree can be determined. Then the dry mass can be calculated, and based on the dry mass, we can determine the carbon content. Um, now I want to give you a short summary of the results of the different methods. Looking at the same study area for the terrestrial laser scan data and for the classic inventory sampling, there was only a small difference of um, 24 cubic meters per hectare in the results. And if all 44 um, forest inventory points were included, and not only the 18 test areas where we also had terrestrial laser scan data, then the total inventory volume is lower. Um, we explain this difference by the fact that the terrestrial uh, laser samples were taken on fully stocked areas and not on the landslides with pioneer forests. And this indicates the importance of an even, even distribution of the samples in the area. Um, our colleagues from the Technical University Vienna also measured uh, the biomass using the drone based laser scan data, and they uh, obtained a surprisingly similar value than the, the one we obtained with the classic sample inventory. You can see here um, 447 and 449 cubic meters per hectare. Um, if you look at the biomass results for the lying deadwood, um, you can see here we haven't received such good matching values um, for the drone-based laser scanning. The average value for the lying deadwood obtained is almost the half value that we calculated by the lying intersect method. We have two possible explanations for this. Um, the lying intersect methods normally require um, a randomly distribution of the logs, and it's possible that the other logs are not ran random distributed. And another explanation is that the drone-based laser scanning could not detect some trunks under the canopy and therefore underestimate the lying that would. Um, as already me mentioned, the elevation of the UAV detector um, resulted in approximately half the amount of dead fat. And here, a further research into whether the UAV data overestimates the volume or whether the line intersect method is not applicable to the area would be necessary. And um, there are still a lot of cumulative uncertainties in the laser scan elevation. Um, here, for example, you see um, uh, um, the, on the point density map, you see uh, several trunk positions. And uh, not everywhere where we can see there would be a stem on the point density map, a tree was um, recognized. So the yellow dots are the recognized trees, but there are some missing. The second example shows a tree um, detected from the terrestrial laser scan. And um, we see that this in truth are two trees and that, and here, um, real, uh, they detected as, as one. 
But nevertheless, the lasers can definitely be is more accurate than the conventional sampling inventory. The conventional method uses only a diameter at three side and the height of a tree to estimate the total volume. And on the other hand, the laser scan data provides an exact 3D point of the tree and allows the volume to be calculated much more accurately. In the end, um, I would like to point out the advantages of the laser scan methods. As already mentioned, um, the most important advantage is the higher accuracy that can be achieved with the laser scanning, leading to a more accurate biomass estimation then it's possible, um, if you think on the drone-based laser scan, to cover large areas very fast, which is also cost-effective, and it is possible to record it remotely without the physical contact with the forest. forest. So also challenging terrain is no problem anymore, such as steep slopes or areas with difficult accessibility. And a monitoring is possible, allowing a temporal analysis of biomass change and carbon over time. And in general, laser scanning methods enable efficient management and planning of forest resources. Thank you for the attention. And now I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Larissa. I will stop your screen. Thanks. Very nice presentation. And yeah, thank you for the comparison and um, on the information on how to how to run digital inventories of forest structure uh, analysis, comparing the three methods, the classic inventory, the ter terrestrial laser scanner and the drones. And we have also seen how they can be really useful for um, assessing uh, or managing forests uh, for sustainable um, forestry, biodiversity conservation and even climate change i guess this is really also valuable when we when we talk about um carbon sequestration we can i can see a direct application on climate change adapt, adaptation strategies and um, especially using uh, nature-based solutions but yeah we can discuss a bit more uh, about this um, topic um, now that we have finished all the presentations i would like to encourage you larissa if you have any url any link that you think is useful that um, the participants to this webinar may have or may consult for further information please sh share it in the in the chat box uh, so they can have access to it okay so um yeah uh, regarding uh, questions that you may have and then uh, Simone has been collected, uh, collecting some of them in the in the chat. Um, Simone, do you want to start with um, some of the questions? Yes, thank you, Fernando. Thank you, Vanessa and Larissa, for your presentation. We have many people congratulating you for your research, and thank you for the information. We have some questions here, so I will start with Vanessa. We have a question from Mariana. If you would recommend uh, a monitoring technology for possible natural catastrophes, for example, fire. And also Robin asked if there are any uh, pitfalls that people often don't think about. Yes. <laughs> so for, for natural catastrophes, Catastrophes. Um, I think remote sensing is still one of the best thing we can do because if the catastrophe occurs, um, our device is not um, influenced by that. And normally those are not just happening on a, on a single point. So we have an aerial impact. So in here, I would uh, still stick to, to remote sensing. And Maybe I, I can uh, go over to the next question with the pitfall. So one of the pitfall is you will have a lot of data. So we are really struggling with um, storage of our data. So this is the, the first pitfall to 
not just collect the data, you have to store it. And we as a university, we are struggling. So you really have to think about is um, your server infrastructure um, the way you can work with it. And afterwards, you have all the data sets you have to analyze. And this is at the moment still the, the biggest pitfall, not just collecting data, also analyze it and really make management uh, to see if management decisions uh, have a positive trend or a negative trend in, in the development of biodiversity uh, and also the environment. And as you can see, so technology, so Larissa uh, was showing that the laser scanner is much more accurate than me measuring out there. So um, it means it, it's really nice to have them also as we saw that it's not always working perfect at the moment. So not every algorithm is now working perfectly that we just can say, oh yes, I collect the data, now I run, and then I get a nice result. So we are not there uh, at the moment, but we can collect data now and maybe those pitfalls of analyzing the data, we will resolve in one or two years, hopefully. Um, maybe it takes a bit longer, but then we can analyze it. And it means, so monitoring always means I have several timestamps. So it would help us to also collect data now. Then we have the first timestamp. And if we collect data in five years, we can already compare all the, if the pitfall analyze the data is not solved now. Sorry, Simone, just to jump in for a moment, following on what Vanessa is saying. I understand what, is there any difference between the algorithms that you are speaking about and artificial intelligence or is the same? Because it's quite the same, so do, you same. can have do, you can use different algorithms. So you you can build up your own model, so they can be very simple. Or you're using deep learning um, uh, because at the moment, so this vector based machine. So there are uh, really a lot of different ways how to analyze data mm -hmm. out there. Um, sometimes the good old I classify something and the the machine learns what I think it is it's much nicer than have deep learning and not really know what's happening in the black box. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm asking because my understanding is, well, or was until, until <laughs> you mentioned this, that artificial intelligence is really making a change in the data processing. Because as you say, what do you do with so much data? So mm -hmm. artificial intelligence, I thought it was going to, or it was already really changing the, the way that we can process and the way that we can have access to it. But apparently we are not there yet. It's still really... It needs oh, a lot yeah. of so, so we try it out several times. Sometimes it's really nice. Sometimes you think, oh, no, I shouldn't show it to anyone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's not working everything. And, and uh, we we uploaded the data to RBMON for the acoustic data, which is a really nice platform. But you have to train also the air, the patterns to say, okay, it's really the time again, because we do not have the existing reference data there. If we train all... Uh, take our knowledge, put a lot of reference data where we really verified it and can say, yes, it's that part. Then yeah. the algorithm's getting faster and faster and it's just throwing in, getting out something nice, but it's a lot of work. Yeah, indeed. Well, thanks a lot. Simone, you, we, can, we can follow up with uh, more questions. Thank you. Larissa, I have a question from Ivana for you. It's maybe very specific. Uh, she asked, uh, when determining the volume of wood, how accurate it is for damaged trees, wind damage, and bark beetle attack? Yeah, that's not that easy, but I think um, the most accurate method would be the laser scanning because it really takes a complete 3D burn cloud of the tree, and you can see how long is this tree really? How is the volume on every part? And but I think there are different methods. It's I think it's for the you would use the lying dead wood or standing dead wood um, methods. And um, I think there's not still as uh, Vanessa already mentioned not that perfect solution. <laughs> um, but I think the future is um, definitely in the laser scan and 3D technology to get it very accurate. 
Thank you. We also have some questions about European wide issues. So Anna is asking, uh, how is your vision for both of you? I think it's, it's how is your vision for Europe regarding the use of modern technologies that we have now for monitoring? She has the impression that there is a big gap at the moment between science and practice. Uh, and then maybe if you can give us also some examples on how this data is used to inform the management practices that comes from you. Mm, that's a tricky question. So there is indeed a huge gap what we have. So we are an university of applied science, so we always like to, to bring it to the ground. And we are really struggling with some technologies. We have another horizon project where we try to bring uh, also the, the same uh, technology to uh, agro um, questions, so to really see, to bring in them on the field of the farmers. And the, there is a lot of going on at EU level, but we are still not at the stage where we can say, oh yes, it's, it's working. There is a perspective that in one or two years we will have it. Um, I think you all know the existing product, but so on EU level, it's more or less the remote sensing parts which are really working fine and which you can um, also implement and also um, another uh, remote sensing part. So like the, the, the global uh, forest uh, watch thing. So where you see you burned area and uh, where do we lose the trees and so on. So these we have and here we have a, a rapid um, evolution on getting new things, but still the gap is not closed. And there is also a bird net and there are good pipelines where for analyzing the data at the moment, but the gap is there. <laughs> And I think um, for EU level, we would take other data with maybe lower resolution, but for the overall, um, it would be enough. So satellite data and Sentinel and yeah. And the EU is really working on it. So there is this project of the digital, digital twins also from the oceans. So there is a lot of money out there that we get a solution, but I think we have just to wait some time and share our data. Every time if you get the opportunity, share the data so that we really can have nice reference data because it's sometimes you train your algorithm, then you go uh, several kilometers west or north and then nothing works because the reference data is not trained on this specific location. So. This is important. Nice that you mentioned the digital twins again, Vanessa. We had a question from Dr. Espinoza at the beginning, uh, asking for other uh, examples of how it is being used. Mm, so do you have anything else to share? Um, so the digital twin is more or less um, a wording we are using now for data we get from an, uh, the environment or from our ecosystems. So it's it it I think it's it sounds more complicated as it is. But for monitoring, you take uh, like a digital twin of the forest. Larissa showed us, and then you have two timestamps, and then you can compare the growth of biomass more accurate. So it's just to have a, a lot of different data sets and a little bit the shift from having a lot of written parameters or results in some PDF and Word documents to, to bringing together everything in huge databases. So at the moment, they're all talking about data lakes, data warehouses. So it just means we put together all the data uh, in a structured way or in a not structured way. and can have uh, those data mining algorithms working on those uh, huge data sets um, we collect, I think, every one of us in some way. Thank you. We also have a question for both of you coming from Neil. Uh, he, has, he asked if you have any experience uh, of working with the forest information system Europe. He also shared the link with us. 
And what are your impressions of this food? We also have some comments on the chat about it. I'm not sure. <laughs> I would need to click on the link. <laughs> uh, maybe I can just add <laughs> while you're clicking the link. Yes, the forest information system is a really useful tool. It's gathered uh, get us information from national reporting from um, all the countries. Um, so there are two points that you have to keep in mind with this tool because it gathers, it, it summarizes nicely so you don't have to uh, read thousands of publications and go to different platforms. Uh, so you can get, uh, get data for an area, for example, where you don't have any data or they are not existing. But there is a trick there because the national reporting comes actually from the ground. <laughs> so uh, yeah, this is the balance that you have to be careful with. So the precision of the data um, should be um, yeah previously determined. It has its pros, it has its cons. Uh, it it has uh, 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 so you you would need to really be careful with using such global platforms. How precise the data come from and che check nationally because then um, you can actually check exactly who reported the data in your country. And you can see how precise or good they are, how relevant they are. Thank you. Thank you for the comment, Jana. Uh, we also have a comment on the chat for you, Fernando, on your intervention. Uh, and yeah, I think that's it. If someone else has anything else, please share with us. Yeah, I would like to ask a question as well to Larissa regarding the comparison that you have done with the with the three methods, the classic, the, the terrestrial laser scanner and the drone. So are the data compatible? Sorry if I, I didn't catch that and you mentioned it before, but is the data, can you compare between the different data? Um, of course you can co compare them and we already did compare them um, part part-wise. For example, um, the height, uh, as I mentioned, of the inventory sampling, uh, we, we didn't record it in the field and we derived it from the TLS data and used it for the calculation um, with the scene. And um, it also makes sense um, if you say uh, you, you have really a big uh, area and you can't make a such a precise drone flight for the whole area, then you maybe make uh, some uh, smaller samples with TLS and um, and com um, compare them with uh, some detail. And so you make the um, calculation um, um, more precise yeah. and better. And yeah. Because you can't go everywhere, and you can scan the whole very big forest. You can't um, scan the whole forest. I agree. So if you're working in natural forests, you cannot go everywhere, or at least you do not want to go everywhere because yeah, this indeed. terrestrial laser scanner is heavy. It's more than twenty kilo, and me going out there with this thing, it's always quite tricky. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have steep forests, a lot of dead wood, so it's nice to have natural forests, and to 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 the height so i think at the moment or i'm i'm really sure um that uh, measuring the height is much more accurate with technology mm. because if you're standing in the forest uh, really to to point out the, the height of every tree there you have no chance yeah indeed and my question my question comes because it's, it's always important to, to to be able to have this continuity in all the conservation efforts that we do and, and to to gather long data series so you can mm. compare because if you're using the classic inventory for many years and suddenly you jump to another method that you cannot compare, for example, if the wood biomass or the or the mm. carbon storage has uh, changed, is really an obstacle in implementing uh, technological solutions as well. But yeah, well, you clarify yes. that is definitely and comparable. I think what is really important to always have in mind, not just taking a new technology say okay yeah nice new technology we need to have one or at least a second cycle with 
both methods so that we can calculate the correlation uh, to know, okay, this was the result of the old method. That means I can translate it to the new method. method. What does it mean now? So that we do not uh, lose the time series so that we have just correlation, uh, know how to uh, correct the data, the new mm. one. And sorry, one more question, Vanessa. Overall, if you have this information, if you don't have it all good, how demanding or how often is uh, our parks implementing technological solutions? Do you see that there is really a reluctancy on applying technological solutions? I know that I'm speaking about for different purposes, different scenarios, so you cannot really draw a common line for all of them. But how is the process of implementing new technological solutions? Because they are normally quite, or they can be uh, really um, expensive, some of them, but also there is a lot of uh, knowledge and training that has to be uh, provided to the to the ground staff or to the personnel to uh, apply them. So is this a step between not, not using uh, new technologies and using new technologies is easy to, to, to take? I think, yes, it depends on what you're taking. So I think all of the Indeed. parks know, now have a camera trap. So I think this is this is not uh, too complicated. The, yeah. the only thing is thinking about what is the amount of data I want to get. Also with the acoustic data, I know that a lot of them are already using those um, devices and remote sensing we use for several years. We now have a higher resolution and not every park have a, a huge uh, database in the background and uh, also the capacity to, to get all the data sets which are out there and really make uh, decisions on, on what does I see there or do I need to have a management uh, a decision on it or not? But I think they are all, uh, so all parks I know, they at least use one technology. Sometimes yeah. not using automatic algorithms to, to analyze them or just doing by hand, but they are using. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, well, and like, uh, go, go. I, I, I also think um, they need to use it because um, it, uh, they have to do a monitoring and um, it's very cost efficient. Um, cost, it takes a lot of costs if they always send people into the field, if there's a change in habitats or biotopes. And um, they know the future is the remote sensing and mm -hmm. the technology to, to make it faster and cost efficient. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And Simone, do we have any do we have any further question in the chat? Because we are good with time. So you said that we, there is no question, no? Okay, so I would like to invite to any of the participants if they want to share any specific experience or any concerns or any comments they may have in regards of uh, the use of technology for conservation and for protected area management. So we are going to give you the capacity to unmute yourself. So please, if anybody wants to comment on something, raise your hand and we will give you the floor, okay? Nobody? Maybe a bit more of time for thinking. Meanwhile, while you think, I'm going to uh, give you briefly some information about the following webinar that we are organizing the, uh, in a week time on nature restoration. It will be as well developed or well, hosted in the framework of the, the Life Enable project uh, for capacity building for Nature 2000 and protected area managers. So. Simone is going to share the registration link. Registrations are already open. And uh, yeah, please uh, feel free to register and to join us next week, OK? And we have, uh, yes, we have one uh, hand raised. Uh, Anna, um, please, uh, you can take the floor. Hi, everyone. Sorry for not being able to be on camera. So very interesting presentations. Thank you for and congratulations for all your work. 
uh, I'm I'm working. I'm collaborating with Propark, which is the the biggest uh, capacity building uh, NGO for people that work in protected areas in Romania. Uh, and my question, because we are doing a program for um, for protected area professional uh, professionists, so we by let's say uh, with drones. So w by using drones in natural areas, how would you? address a concern uh, for a, one a person that works in a protected area management system. Uh, how does it affect the wildlife, for example? Because we see concerns that um, the, the drones, for example, that would survey the areas uh, have a, a bad impact on the wildlife. So how would you convince uh, someone to use technology uh, in the protected area? without or with minimizing the potential risk that technology brings in the equation? That's a tricky was... question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, first of all, it always depends on which drone you use because we have some which are really huge and they make a lot of noise. And then we have those small, tiny ones which you hardly can see if they are too high. And this makes a huge impact on, on how wildlife is reacting because sometimes these huge ones, uh, you cannot see that there are uh, big concerns uh, because it's uh, of really they can see it, but it's not an easy question you can solve because you always have to think who is disturbed, is it a bird, is it a mammal, and on every um, one you have another impact. So I think for a long-term perspective, we need to get rid of drones in nature conservation areas. We are not there at the moment, but we have satellites up there with really high resolution. So uh, it would be very nice if we can have access to, the, to this high resolution remote sensing part to really minimize uh, the, the, the um, drones in the protected areas and for the rest, at the moment, we are still a little bit lacking of um, really good data on how the wildlife is reacting uh, really. So because if they are not flying away a bird, it doesn't mean that it's not stressed. So also in here, there is research going on. But at the moment, I will just say, try to minimize and look if there is satellite-based data you can use and have a look on what are the animals out there. Maybe also look when uh, breeding times that they don't fly uh, during these times. And yeah, thank you very much. We have another hand raised uh, from Hans from ECO. Hans, please, uh, you can take the floor. Sorry, Hans, you're muted. Okay, now? Yes, yes, you... thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Anna, for this very interesting question. And I want to emphasize that we need more research in this field. How it, uh, what, what are the impacts of drones on on the wildlife? So, um, if anybody is doing work on this, it would be very important to to share. Um, but we we should not forget that our terrestrial methods are also a disturbance. So in, in the in the Rohrach, uh, Forest Reserve, we were walking with four people 10 days. This is also a disturbance in the ecosystem for birds and wildlife, while the drone took one day, only one day, to examine the whole, the whole area. And while we assessed about 500 trees, the drone in, 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 in 10 days with four people, and the drone did 20,000 trees in one day. So uh, maybe the disturbance is even shorter, but uh, we we would be very interesting in, in cooperating in this field and, and bringing knowledge together. Uh, so Anna, um, it's a very important question you, you have risen. Yeah, definitely. And I think overall, the impact of uh, technologies in, in nature conservation and the same that has happened for years uh, with the, uh, yeah, the scientific methods for uh, researching is, is a really important uh, factor to take into account. 
So thank you very much. If there is no further um, comments or uh, interventions that you want to do, uh, I think we can call it the day. Uh, I really appreciate the, 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 the big number of participants that we had in the webinar. Please don't hesitate to register to the next webinar if it's of your interest. And to end with, I would like to ask you to fill up this short survey that I am um, sharing with you in the, in the chat box. It's a, it's a small, it's a short form that uh, you can fill up in, in a couple of minutes that will help us improve uh, these webinars. And thanks again. So uh, hopefully we see you soon and have a, have a great uh, weekend being Friday. So all the best. Okay, goodbye.